Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Softcast. This is your host, our Major Matt Parrish, and I am super excited. I actually have a guest in studio, and uh, we have a phenomenal guest for you. One of the coolest things uh, for me personally, and I hope for you as a listener, is to be able to talk to amazing people across the soft enterprise that have been pivotal parts of so many historical and important uh, points in our special operations history. And so today, We've got the awesome opportunity of talking to Mark Stevens. He's a Commando Hall of Honor member, meaning sort of our Special Operations Command Hall of Fame. Mark, thanks for coming in. Thanks for joining us. And actually being in studio, how refreshing, not uh, not Absol- being on Zoom, man. No, absolutely. I appreciate you having me in. No, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. You know, I've had a chance to have a few kind of Commando Hall of Honor guys on, Rick Lamb and a few others, uh, uh, you know, Will Markham uh, as well. Just uh, a, a very cool opportunity. You know, I like to start off with, you know, as you're growing up, what makes you, you know, what makes you think, I want to go into the service period, but then ultimately what makes you think, hey, man, I want to test my metal and continue to assess and select and kind of move up the chain? So it, it was probably a, a uh, good path for me. I actually grew up on a ranch here in Florida. Yeah. And uh, my dad managed uh, the largest cattle ranch in the state. Yeah. So I grew up, you know, I guess I use that term free range kid. And <laughs> so go. I'm running around nice. and, and, you know, hunting, fishing, yeah. a lot of responsibility early yeah. on. And uh, wasn't necessarily the best student, but definitely uh, enjoyed all the other stuff. And uh, when, uh, when, it, when I finally got to high school, I wrestled, played sports and all that stuff. Yeah. And I think wrestling was probably one of the pivotal things that I did that helped me through my entire career that, you know, that cliche embrace the suck. Yeah. Well, it it really, it really helped me because you get to that point, you know what it feels like and you know, you can get past it. So I used that. But when I got in high school, um, you know, I was at that point, go to college, what do you do? And I was at least savvy enough at the time to know that I probably would have not done great in college. Mm-hmm. I had the aptitude. I just, it was, it was not, I just didn't have the drive. I was in the same boat. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so I thought I'll join the military. Yeah. I'll, you know, I'll do that, that standard thing for years, uh, get the GI bill. Yeah. and 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 get the clearance and i yeah. i chose communications as as the initial field yeah and uh but like a you know like a lot of folks i i had you know i'd grown up with the john wayne movie and you yeah. know and i had some other people in my life that had been in the Viet, vietnam era time frame yeah. and stories about rangers and special forces and seals and all that stuff sure and so um when i came in you know, that was my intent was, okay, I'll do my four years, but of course I wanted to go special operations no matter what it was. And so that's kind of how it started. Um, And then, uh, you know, when it started getting close to that four year mark being done, so I joined and I I came into uh, special forces and um, I, 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 you know, I had that pivotal decision to make, you know, do you reenlist, do you get out, what do you do? And and I realized I think I had found my calling yeah and decided to stay in and it was funny at first i was resisting it so i would extend not re-enlist i was just kind of half <laughs> stepping in yeah. a little bit yeah <laughs> and, and then there was a point when i finally said you know what this this is this is what i should be doing yeah that's awesome man i i had uh you know very similar thought process so like i think we a lot of us do like oh I'll just i'll join <laughs> i'll do it you know and then uh yeah i, I had the same feelings like all right as soon as I'm able, uh, I'm continuing to do this. So you eventually, you continue to move up. Uh, you, you, you attack another assessment selection, mm-hmm. moving on to a special mission unit. And then you start to have the opportunity to actually deploy and put some of these skills to the test. Yes. One of them being in Somalia, right? Mm-hmm. As one of the guys on the ground for off Operation Gothic Serpent or Black Hawk Down. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you talk us through kind of your experience there and how, how, did, how did you get to that point? And sure. then how did you feel as you were there? So... It, it was uh, it was pretty surreal in the beginning because you know the the us as an organization had gone through our process of identifying who was going to go and yeah. you know based on the mission set at the at the time yeah. and like many things the mission that you deploy on changes yeah. when you get on the ground. And uh, so we went through all that. I was very fortunate to, uh, uh, you know, be part of uh, one of the uh, the folks that got to go. And then we got there in uh, late August. Mm-hmm. 
and it and it literally started out with getting on the ground and starting to stage everything and then receiving mortar fire yeah. um it was funny because rick and i had we, we kind of talk about this uh on on occasion yeah. our different perspectives of of what went on and uh but it, it was uh it's something that um i will never forget and it became the measure for me mm. for everything that i did after that so in afghanistan iraq other places that i can't talk about but right. other uh, operations that that occurred it, it was always was it somalia bad yeah that was kind of my measure and, I, and you know and you yeah. you and i'll tell you afghanistan and iraq definitely had their moments no question about yeah. it but it's funny probably because that was so early on that was kind of my my impression and measure yeah. but uh that's what i was gonna ask how long had you been in the service period but in the unit at the time when you guys so i think i i had gotten to the unit when i was 24. Nice. so i was pretty yeah. young when i got there That's awesome. and i had just got there yeah so um and uh so you know for me it was kind of you know i'm, I'm definitely one of the new guys sure and i'm trying to learn you know everything you're supposed to do you know and 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 be able to perform and 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 be a productive member of of, sure. of the operation and everything yeah. that was going on and and for me something i'll touch on in a minute uh from a mindset standpoint but as we went through that entire time we had seven missions the the seventh culminating with what everybody knows sure. is the october 3rd and 4th event and clearly that was the worst of it but there were some interesting, uh, you know, operations, missions that had taken place leading up to that. So it's, you know, it's kind of our process of, of uh, you know, you're after one individual. So you go through the food chain trying to get the, sure. to yeah. the right person, right information to get you to, you know, jackpot. Right. So we, um, we uh, you know, went through all that. And then on that particular day, um, I was put in a position to be the uh like an l and o with the 10th mountain as a qrf because yeah. we had had kind of a break in operations intel drove a daylight hit and what we didn't know was during that that break our break they had uh you know really prepped the ground for this fight yeah um they had brought in a lot of weapons uh they had created uh, uh you know they had channelized the city had yeah. pre-positioned things that they could use as, as blockades and whatnot and and i swear to god i i thought everybody there either had an ak-47 or, or a rpg yeah. one, one or the other maybe both and uh, so uh you know we went through that fight but during that fight my my kind of the the thing for me was i didn't want to fail sure. my mates yeah i had kind of taking that position I wasn't coming home because once once the crashes had occurred um, I uh, quickly linked up with the, the there, there was a convoy that most people don't even know about it was the initial piece that went out we were actually headed to crash site one yeah. and while we were in route going through k4 circle crash the second crash happened and so you had this mindset of people and and it, it's it's hard to understand if it the other person's mindset but you have the guys that are in fighting to get out sure and you have the guys on the outside fighting to get in yeah so us as qrf we were fighting and so i was with the 10th mountain and and they they did a phenomenal job but you know this was probably the the most complex chaotic thing yeah. that all of us but especially them were thrown into in that moment and the decisions that had to be made, how you, the processes you had to go through while going in route. And we ended up driving through three ambushes mm. um, and uh, and then literally had to turn our convoy around. And we actually, while that was going on, started to take uh, friendly fire from, from the main UN base. Wow. Um, they were shooting at noise. They didn't know exactly who they were shooting at. And it was heavy weapons. It was 50 cal yeah. type stuff and uh, never, Never would like to have that happen again, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. and, friendly fire is not so friendly. No. Yeah, I had that in Iraq as well. Yeah. Uh, Bad days. Yeah. And uh, so we turned the convoy around, had to drive through the same ambushes again. Wow. And yeah. then and then that led into the, the, the big multinational convoy. So the planning for that was kind of occurring while we were going through this process. And, um, and then, you know, 
we went out on that and then the rest is history you know we were able to sure. get to the to uh cr the the crash site one and that's where the the bulk of the people were recovered and all that and then we had individuals that went to the other crash site to confirm yeah the that, the situation that's an interesting position um you know as a new guy you know you've you've made it to the place you want to be you're deploying and now you're over here how What's your emotion as you're trying, you know, you're with another unit trying mm -hmm. to help get to your mates and the other members mm -hmm. of the task force? Like, that's got to be a very, you know, obviously you're taking fire as well, but there's, uh, anytime you're not with the, you know, with your right. mates, that's a tough situation to be in. And I'm sure you're doing everything you can to, uh, to, to get that multinational planning effort that's probably not as quick as you're used to moving in the right mm -hmm. direction. That's got to be a pretty tough pretty tough as a young guy it, it was yeah. the, the, it was definitely a challenge because you know in that moment with the 10th mountain you know they didn't all know who we were sure yeah. and so we we look different we're dressed different i've yeah. got you know uh you know uh, officers enlisted some senior on, on in fact on one of the vehicles i was on and you know th this was a you know there, th there was those moments where tactically you could see the, the the gap. Sure, yeah. And so, you know, I'm trying to commu uh, maintain communications with this uh, this leader so yeah. that we can help because we have the assets flying around and help direct him to the crash sites. Yeah. Um, because even though you had uh, imagery and whatnot, what was on the ground was was yeah. changing because they were moving blo bl blocking yeah. positions and whatnot. And so, you're maintaining the communication. You're trying to translate that, and then you have you know other officers that are uh, giving commands to small segments because their communications is a bit broken, mm. and 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 they sometimes challenge kind of the tactical decision on the ground because they didn't understand the full picture, yeah, the sure. full picture yeah. or the fight, yeah, you know because when they came over there it was they were very restricted in their ROE, you know it was it was very much a peacekeeping mission initially they sure. knew they were in a QRF role, yeah, but it was but but the ROE that they were accustomed to was. Mm -hmm. It really, it really kind of stifled their their ability to react in the moment. Yeah, and and so those were things that I found that were challenging, because you're you know you're obviously trying to convey confidence. You're trying to convey that you have a handle on the situation. You're you're bringing good information to to their leadership to to be able to react. react. But at the same time, you're receiving 360 degree fire almost. Right, and so you're you're trying to deal with that at right. the same time and it was very effective fire at, at times yeah it's uh you know a couple things one how critical and and really uh, how much foresight to have you there as an lno mm -hmm. I, you know uh, one of the things that's always struck me anytime i've worked with a jsoc element or or as a as a part of it is the level of lnos sent out everywhere um that always seem to be the right guys and gals at the right place at the right time because i can't imagine without having an lno there right. how much worse that would have been because you're essentially fighting the entire city it's so complex mm -hmm. i mean i you know some people uh might wonder you know this is third or fourth at least episode that we've talked about that specific time frame one it's because it's so so much of a one-off mm -hmm. at that time and space and everything but also because of the complexity of that yeah. with the amount of different elements that are coming through it's it's a really it's an interesting it's an interesting historical look after Desert One and mm -hmm. sort of the failure in, in that because of lack of interoperability. Fast forward only, you know, about 10 years later, or yep. 12 years later, and you're in this position. How did you feel? I mean, obviously, uh, you're in one of the most complex situations possible, but how did you feel as far as interoperability as being the guy sort of helping the other team? How did you feel like were communication strong? Obviously, it's fragmented, you know, sure. fog of war. Well, I, I, I think, you know, to your point about an LNO is, in you know, in today's fight, today's war, our military across the board, yeah. even service to service, we're much more compatible. Right. And there's a reason. We've yeah. learned that. Yeah. At that time, yeah. is, is something as simple as the way we communicated on a radio in yeah. JSOC while yeah. there 
versus the way a conventional force did. They yeah. could we couldn't talk to each other. Yeah. So it took an LNO. Yeah. With my with my radio system to be yep. able to communicate securely with our folks and then translate that over. So just from that function alone. Yeah. It was critical. And then and then to understand how our TTPs were and what was happening on the ground and be able to translate that to keep their mission and fire power, fire power on point yeah. to get us to where we needed to be to try to, you know, you know, on the on the first convoy, start that first rescue process. But yeah. unfortunately, it didn't it didn't work out. But um, but it, but it's very critical. And I think Somalia also for a lot of reasons was very pivotal. You don't always know it at the time, mm -hmm. but you see what it brings to our military. When you look at from a medical standpoint, how we triage, how we treat our wounded yeah. has come leaps and bounds. And obviously this conflict has even brought it to a greater sure. point, but that leap from Somalia to everything pre 9-11 yeah. was instrumental, our equipment our, yeah. our, you know, the way we, we handled comms, the way we handled our, our casualties, um, how we moved in, in a street or yeah. urban and setting, yeah. all that stuff came out of that. And it, and even, you know, when you come back from a fight like that, it's very easy for our military to try to train and equip from your last fight. Yeah. You have to learn those lessons, yeah. but you still have to look forward to your next enemy. No, it's a great point. I mean, obviously, as we're coming out of the 20 years of Afghanistan mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, m multiple years prior of Iraq, you know, we're, we're looking at those same things. It is interesting because, you know, that innovation and that lessons learned, mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about that. That buzzword is out there all the mm -hmm. time. Lessons learned and everything. Unfortunately, a lot of times the best lessons that we have to learn come from a situation that's not that fun to be the guy on the ground in yeah. during that time. Uh, but it is interesting because of how how complex and how much spotlight that got mm -hmm. it did ramp forward a ton of as you said medical communication other innovation that sets us up in mm -hmm. a better place than we would have been uh you know later on in that fight as you come out of that and you start moving up as a leader in the organization mm -hmm. you've now got combat experience very very relevant combat experience from a very complex place you know how did you feel able to kind of be a a an innovator towards lessons learned and shaping those techniques and things as you're going through other missions uh up until you know ultimately 9-11 sure, sure. happens and, and and what's funny is at that time you know people with relevant combat experience w th there weren't as many as we yeah, obviously have obviously, today you yeah. had people who had gone through grenada panama yep. and, and uh, other things but even even that pot of people was still a small pool sure yeah and so um you know, what, what I was, you know, fortunate, the, the folks that I got to work, I mean, this is special operations in general, but then the organization I went to, yeah. the people that I got to work with, you know, n not all of them came with combat experience, you know, initially, but, you know, the, the aptitude, the drive yeah. to be able to, to listen, learn, and, and, and take guidance. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was a team leader, uh, you know, any one of the guys on my team could have been the team leader. Sure. Yeah. It was just, you know, when it was my yeah. time, it was my time. And so you have to perform at that level. Yeah. Uh, but to answer your question, but, but having that experience was incredibly relevant. And, and, and I think I was able to leverage it at the right times because there were situations where, you know, we, we you know, because of the role of that organization, we're going to be forward. We're going to be in places many times like soft in general to prevent the greater conflict. Yeah. And so uh, you find yourself in situations where, you know, where something could be very chaotic. Mm. It, it, it allowed me to, again, use that measure. Is yeah. this Somalia bad? <laughs> yeah. And if it's not, you know, we just, we stay calm. We, we focus and, and we, and we deal with the situation in front of us. And so I, I was, you know, it was it was a tough experience, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think it 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 kind of set the tone for me for the rest of my career. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a saying: the hardest thing you've ever done is the hardest thing you've ever done, right? Some people's yep. hardest thing they've ever done is here, and some people went through Mogadishu, and now that bar has been raised. And there is something, uh, you know, whether it's in a uh, assessment and selection or whether it's in combat or whatever, mm -hmm. where when your bar gets raised, then it's easier to have perspective later on. It's like, hey. Nobody's shooting at us. That's right. We're, we're okay. Or maybe they are shooting at us, but it's not. It's not Somalia bad. Yeah. 
Like we can we can get through this. So it, it is a uh, a different reframing sometimes of your perspective. You know, as as we get towards that nine eleven time frame, right? We know that the you know a lot of the precursors to nine eleven were there in that fight in Somalia, mm-hmm. and they're and they're churning and sort of growing through the nineties. What was your lens on that, having been there at sort of the nascent of that? And then obviously nine eleven takes place, yeah. and now we're a mile a minute trying to you know go that, and get retribution. You know, that, that's a great point, and I think it's lost. Um, on, on many just because uh, it, it wasn't fairly represented yeah. is what what people, when you go back and you see how are we in the war on terror today, you know, a lot of people's perspective was 9-11. It mm-hmm. was like, you know, boom, it happened. We're in this huge fight yeah. and, and really didn't- Like ha- it came out of nowhere. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. didn't really have the understanding or the, yeah. the past knowledge and understanding of what had occurred that led to this. Right. Uh, there was there was eight plus years of things that occurred that led us to 9/11, which yeah. was their culmination, if you will. Um, so, in February of '93 was when the the first attack on the towers happened. Yeah, it didn't bring it down, but they they it was an attempt. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, again with Somalia, another uh, relevance to that fight and uh, good and bad is. The fair deed was who we were, you yeah. know, there to capture, kill, but his his people, his militia, were being trained by Al Qaeda and Bin Laden. Yeah. So they were receiving training and weapons uh, during that that whole pre us getting there. So you know, before we showed up, it was a UN mission. It was a peacekeeping mission. It was a humanitarian mission. They were trying to. They were using food as collateral to control the populace. Right. And so, and fair deed was the head you know, warlord, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, doing that. And so when the UN had had, uh, uh, UN peacekeepers killed and whatnot, then we were called then for yeah. our piece of it. But all those things had occurred leading up to that. So Somalia was very pivotal because after Somalia happened, after the decision was made on how we proceeded after October 3rd and 4th, we had, there were two decisions to be made. There was send us back in right. and demand that Faradid be hand over and our pilot. Yeah. Or, and, and we had, you know, we, I, you know, I, I hate every time I think about this, but we had, we had our, you know, brothers being drug around in the street and yep. we needed to recover them yep. and, and the importance of that. And, um, you know, that should have been the demand, but what did happen was the decision to pull back. Mm-hmm. And, and if you look at today, this translates, this mm-hmm. still translates so when you when you put your military in that position, you know it's politics that gets us there. But when we're there, you have to think through what 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 are the consequences of the moves that are made, you know, pre, during, and post an event. Yeah. And so after that event, when the the political decision was made to pull back and not go back in and make that demand, that showed weakness. Yeah. And we see what weakness does today. Yeah. And that that was the message that was sent and i and i believe and i'm paraphrasing but the words from bin laden is you know the united states is a paper tiger if you bloody their nose they'll quit yeah. now the people on the ground did not quit right. we won yeah. we 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 annihilated that city right. but but politically that was the message that was sent and then if you look after that through the through the 90s 96 98 2000 the the coal yeah you know leading into 9/11 yeah, and and that was all. That is all connected. Yeah, well, he, I had an awesome opportunity to talk to Jeff Struker uh, that we released in episode two, and and he made the comment, you know, he's like, hey, I'm retired, so I'm going to say this, you know, you know, we're we're not politicians while we're in uniform or any of those things, and we try to stay political. But looking back at that, you know, he was there as well as part mm-hmm. of the task force ranger, and he he said, hey, you know, for me, if it's not worth every single person you're putting in fire. Uh, if it's not worth all of their lives, then it's not worth going to do, right? Not that we want that to happen, but that has to be the seriousness right. of it. We can't play with like, right. oh, we're going to do, oh no, as soon as we, as soon as we take something, we, oh, we're going to pull away because then yeah. we ultimately show like, okay, hey, as long as we take a couple Blackhawks down or as long mm-hmm. as we bloody them and uh, we do the right thing, hey, they'll leave, yeah. right? And so he's like, you know, if we don't have the stomach to fully finish the job, 
don't start the job. Right. Uh, which I thought was a no. Know, it, it's a it's, it's, yeah. it's a great point. It's a very yeah. fair point because you know when we got there in August, we that was part of the that was part of the discussion at the levels that the discussion occurred with you know the Joint Chiefs, the SecDef, and POTUS to send us. Yeah. Um, and and the understanding of that point was when we got on the ground, you had the UN ROE, but we had mm. our own ROE. Right. It was very distinct and yeah. different. It did not take long for that to change. Yeah. So when I when I mentioned we yeah. got mortared, we responded to that. We responded to that knowing that we had received mortar fire, we identified the tube, destroy the tube. Yeah. It was so ridiculous that after that, that if they were to cover the tube up with a cloth or a blanket and you couldn't define the outline of the tube, you couldn't attack it even though you knew that was the tube. Wow. That was the difference between the two ROEs. Yeah. And 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 the sad thing is Ours started to get when when I say comp it wasn't compromised by our folks, but out of their control, our ROE started to get compromised. It's pulled the wrong way <laughs> to 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 fall more yeah. in line with what the UN mm -hmm. was looking for, yeah. uh, and still trying to accomplish what our mission was over there. Yeah, as we uh, as we fast forward into sort of the nine eleven global war on terrorism, uh, I'm really interested in your lens because like. A lot of guys from my generation, right? We joined after 9-11. You know, I joined in mm -hmm. 2002 and shipped in early 2003. Going through the Q course, I'm a kid. I finally get to go over there and, hey, I'm fighting, right? You were a senior guy at that point with, with experience. The country gets mm -hmm. attacked and you're in the most elite unit to go and do something about it. Like, what was your lens of then 9-11 and that immediate, hey, we're going over there and we're, we're getting some? 100%. So, two... Before I answer that, there's something you, there's something yeah. you brought up that I think I don't know anywhere in this conversation that it would come up, but I think yeah. it's a fair point to make. Is we we've been at war for 20 years. Yeah. Not once did we have a draft. Yeah. So I know we ding, you know, our younger generation. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Not once did we have a draft. Yeah. We we never wanted, and they knew when yeah. they came in what they were going to get into. So to me. To be able to serve with the folks I got to serve with, and then as I progressed, got yeah. senior, and continue to serve with people like that, that was probably one of the most important takeaways and mm. honors that I had yeah, while serving. Yeah. So, so point. yeah, it, yeah. it was uh, so nine eleven happened. Um, I was literally on a, uh, a joint uh, training exercise in Hungary. I'd <laughs> flown from uh, Fairford, England, en route to Hungary, we already had, so we had the, uh, the uh, JSOC um, uh, HQ was already, uh, uh, already there. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were moving. And um, so apparently when we were in flight, the first plane hit. Oh, wow. And then, um, and then while we were, as we were breaking down and unloading our aircraft, the second plane hit. But before that happened, you know, we had people come up and say, hey, a plane hit the tower. It was, right. it was of, consequence to bring it up sure and of course i think everybody's immediate thought in that moment was is somebody must have had a heart attack yeah, and accident. messed up and flew it was yeah. a small plane didn't really know yep. the gravity of the situation but while we were unloading we got word the 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 next plane went down yeah and it, i i can tell you you know i wasn't around each and every person but i was around a lot of people and nothing needed to be said yeah. instantly sure. instantly everybody knew what was going on and so we knew obviously the grx is going to be canceled <laughs> and so that was the moment when the you know the the headquarters folks were trying to figure out they were they were talking back to dc trying to figure out what what the next moves were and uh we literally almost launched from there yeah to start the first uh uh, uh mission yeah uh, in response but uh, the decision was made no because we we didn't have a full grasp of what was going on and at that point. If you remember, there were still aircraft that were one unaccounted for and two, yeah. they weren't sure what their disposition was and stuff like that. So, rather than kind of that knee jerk reaction, yeah. um, when the when the whole world was a no fly zone, we were a, a couple of those airplanes that that got to fly back. So we got back our. HQ folks were already in discussions with DC and in the White House and figuring out what the next steps were. Sure. And um, and so uh, once the decisions were made, we launched. Yeah. We launched, and then uh, um, 
you know, I, I can't get into to great detail on, on, on the methodology of all sure. that, but yeah. I will tell you that it was amazing to see everybody come together. You're already working with stellar people, sure, but yeah. now you're seeing them at another level because yeah. now it's, it, you know, it's important, but it's personal. Yeah. It's personal. Yeah. And, you know, just to do something as simple as a, as a, as a, uh, rehearsal, you know, you're in a time crunch, you know, mm -hmm. we, we have to get certain things done. And so not everything's being done in a, in a complete culminated manner yeah. and, uh, but you're getting it done. And then we, you know, and then we, we deployed and then we were able to stage, um, yeah. and staging for us was, uh, moving from the U S through uh, various countries and getting to a, a point to where we uh, we uh, were then moved out to the USS Kitty Hawk. And then as you, you know, I, I think that's a great point of it being personal, by the way, if, like if you think about as you guys are going to Somalia, like you're going to do something somewhere else and take mm -hmm. care of that mission somewhere else. Now it's like, hey, we're responding for, yep. for you know, it's a, it's a definite different frame perspective again. And, and I think for you all at that point, you've seen all the boil. Right, you've seen it from Somalia all the way through mm -hmm. the '90s, like you said. Nothing needed to be said because to you all, like this wasn't some wild aberration out of nowhere. As soon as the second plane hits, like, yep, all right, we've seen we've seen the prelude to this. Not that we knew it was coming, but right, we, we've got an idea. It's not a crazy uh, out of nowhere uh, that that someone wants to attack us. Obviously, they had tried a few times. Um, as you become then a member of Task Force Sword, you know, we've got Task Force Dagger, Task Force Sword, mm -hmm. and y you are again in a pivotal position or a p in a pivotal uh, part of SOCOM and Joint Special Operations mm -hmm. Command and all these things coming together and showing the fruit of mm -hmm. the lessons learned from Desert One and from Mogadishu mm -hmm. and all these things. You're now on the biggest stage, you know, it is essentially the Super Bowl. It is, we're responding to 9-11 and you are now in that role, how did you feel as far as the integration of those task forces going forward and, you know, juxtaposition versus sort of the Somalia time sure. frame now, now in, uh, you know, in Afghanistan? No, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it, so I, I'm, I'm able to look back on it now and, and see it even with a, with a greater perspective. But yeah. in the moment, we, we all knew how important it was. We sure. all knew the gravity of the situation. But I still don't think you could fathom, you know, what we were getting ready to do. And, and certainly nobody knew the outcome. Right. And, um, you know, I look at this as kind of the modern day Doolittle Raid. Yeah. You know, this what so what 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 went down between the two task force was amazing and unique to, to both of them. So task force dagger would most yeah. people know about and and uh people kind of have that they they know them as the horse soldiers and and yep. 12 strong the movie um so on 19 october both elements launched one launched to go up north and link up with the northern alliance yep. with the plan to then link up establish rapport and then yep. start the push south right. and then other teams inserted with with uh, you know, different lines south to to be able to, as they push to engage the enemy. What our role was as Task Force Sword was was very much a retaliatory type quick strike. Yeah, and and it was and it was to send a, a clear message that we can touch you anytime, anywhere we want. Yeah, and it and it was incredibly critical. And when and when you're setting out on a mission like that no mistakes can be made yeah because it, it it would be it would be like two 9-11s happen yeah and so you know that was the understanding the gravity of that um you know we did all the planning we did as much as we could we you know we, we were reading uh soviet after action reports yeah. and you know as much information as you could in a very short amount of time and uh what was very unique about this is this was a clear demonstration of everything that th the special operations community and JSOC in particular had worked for so many years after Desert One, Desert mm -hmm. Shield, or, yeah. or Desert yeah. One, um, to, to, again, another amazing lesson learned, you know, tragedy at the time, sure. but, and, you know, looking at it objectively and figuring out what do we do to fix this? How do we become better? Mm -hmm. This mission 
was that culmination mission. Yeah. Uh, from the complexity of it, from everybody that was involved in it, because it was truly a joint effort. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we went on the USS Kitty Hawk, which at that time had its own, uh, you know, flight uh, wing of, of fighter aircraft. Yeah. They were removed. Mm. An Army aviation rotary wing package was placed on top of a, a Navy yeah. aircraft carrier. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when we, we got to the point where we could, you know, stage and had the legs, um, we, we launched. And, and I guess the point for me was that nobody knew what we were getting into. There, there was no FOBs. There was right. no QRF. There right. was nothing. Yeah. You got on that bird and you flew to go do that mission and whatever happened, happened. But there was nobody on the ground to come and fix it. Right. You know, there was no golden hour from for from a chasm. So yeah. it was it was a different mindset than than I had been in in yeah. any other position. You know, when I look at later time in Afghanistan, later time in Iraq, it's taking nothing away. It was just yeah. when 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 you're that first one in like that, it's a it's a very different mindset. And so when we launched, uh, you know, we flew across the Arabian Sea into Pakistan, into Afghanistan. So now while all of that's going on, you've got the Air Force coming in and refueling these these rotary wing assets yeah. as we're going in. And so now they're part of it. So literally every aspect and, and we and, and as we uh, were rolling into the target, we had, you know, laid in a B-52 to do a, a, a strike yeah. to take care of some, uh, you know, some potential overwatch overlooking weaponry that could have impacted our infill. And so now you're talking about timing. Yeah. And and it was amazing uh, how everything came together and the timing of it all, because this is, today is still a world record for the longest heel of assault in U.S. history. Yeah. Um, even after 20 years of war. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of shows the complexity of it. But when we were able to get in, we had we had some issues. My, in fact, my uh, my helicopter uh, uh, hit the wall, and then uh, we ended up uh, flying over the city of Kandahar, uh, which redirected fire. And they actually thought that that was where we were infilling, while the rest of the assets got in. And it probably literally bought us fifteen minutes on the ground, huh. which yeah. was you know not planned, but it kind of worked out. Yeah. And uh, so when we finally were able to get in, we 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 kind of had to do a, a bit of a crash landing in and on our target, and uh, and we were able to prosecute the target. Uh, uh, Mul Omar was not on target, but right. that would have been a Benny. Yeah. The 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 key to this was that we demonstrated them. This was the Taliban's White House. Yeah. And we touched them and there wasn't anything we could do about it. And they knew it. Yeah. And, you know, there could have been, I love New York stickers placed on walls <laughs> as we cleared rooms right. and things like that. And maybe pamphlets uh, that were laid out, you know, just to let them know, because even when we leave that we were there. Yeah. And uh, I will tell you, that was, that was one of the coolest experiences ever because, um, you know, we were able to get in there prosecute that mission uh, with all the complexity that came. And simultaneously, the Rangers hit Objective Rhino yeah. and uh, did an airfield seizure. Yep. Um, and then once we were finished on target in uh, Gecko, we, we went over to Rhino to uh, fuel back up and then uh, head back to the ship. And then after that, follow-on missions occurred and whatnot. But, you know, I, I think the the complexity of both those operations and then the fact that we you know we were willing to lean out like that mm -hmm. to to let our enemy know that we are willing to touch them sent a very powerful message and again the key i mentioned you know things happen during that but they're always going to happen you're always mm -hmm. going to have a bump but uh, you know do you have the training do you have the ability do you have the right people to work through the problem yeah. because you know in special operations i i see I see us as 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 just really good problem solvers, yeah. and and so you address each issue that comes up, you deal with it, and and you move on. Yeah, there's never been a perfect plan, nor no. will there ever be one. Adaptability <laughs> is the, is the key. I'm curious, as you're getting ready to exfil that target, you just made the longest helo flight. You're on the tip of the tip of the tip of the spear of America's response to something that we're all raging about. You are in the position to do something about it. You clear, you know, you crash, you clear this compound. 
as your ex feeling? What's going through your mind? How are you feeling? It it was in the moment. It was you know it was just all about uh, completing the mission, making sure. sure that we had accomplished everything we were there to accomplish. Um, I don't think I really thought much about it until after I got back on the ship. I had also gotten yeah. uh, dinked up on that. <laughs> and so I had to sit for five and a half hours uh, and, I, and I failed to mention it to my medic because what I didn't want to do is get pulled off my bird and put on another bird and flown yeah. to Germany. So right. I, I- You uh, wanted to be back at the ship and then get patched up there, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, gotcha. uh, and of course I caught a little bit of hell for that. <laughs> and, uh, but um, it wasn't until then that you, you realized the gravity of it um, of, of going into enemy territory like that um, and, and, and really much of it being the unknown yeah, and accomplishing exactly what you set out to do yeah, and, and being successful and, and, and bringing, you know, unfortunately we lost, we lost a, a ranger on, on Rhino, but yep. you know, f for the gravity and complexity uh, you know, we were able to get everybody back and uh, um, and 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 have mission su success for what we were there to do. Yeah. And and it, obviously, Task Force Dagger. You know, everybody knows uh, they remained on the ground and continued to push and the success that they had. Uh, after that, um, you know, we we reinserted on on continuous uh, uh, operations, but they were nothing like that that first impact and yeah. and, and what it represented. Yeah. It's. Uh the other thing that I think it's it I keep having to tell myself as I'm listening to you tell that story is like you also like we now are looking back at this knowing that this is a 20 year long war right at that point not only is it uncertainty mm -hmm. of what you're doing that night but there's no idea of like after this yeah are we are we staying here are we you know at that point nobody's thinking hey we're gonna create fobs all over this place and right. you know my my kids are gonna be there yep. uh you know it's just it's such an interesting um look at that as you're as you come back you get patched up you start reinserting reinserting mm -hmm. on uh, on follow on targets at what point um does does the gravity i guess uh, you know not just of that single mission but that hey we've got we've got a prolonged war that's yeah. starting here like where does that start to kind of um so that that's a that's an interesting question. It's a great question. I, I think for me, so I went back. Um, I, I was uh, I had to go back uh, due to the injury. I was going right. to go out with the the Brits, but uh, the wound had gotten infected. So yeah. the patch job on the ship was uh, just you know, maybe it was a five and a half hour you know healer. Uh, yep. Okay. And and so <laughs> I so I I end up reinserting yeah. back in the very beginning of December. Okay. And we actually uh, reinserted to a village uh, just outside of Kandahar to link up with Karzai. Yeah. And uh, that's unfortunately when that 2,000 pound JDAM mm -hmm. hit us by mistake. Yeah. And uh, I think it was during that period of time and then probably reinforced when we, when we went into Iraq mm. that you, you understood the differences of, of the, of the, tribes or the people that you were you were engaged with but the overall connection of the fight yeah so when you say war on terror that you know th th this isn't black and white this isn't going to be a, a battle and it's over you know it's there's the fight piece but as important is the education piece it's 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 everything you have to do to uh, you know show what freedom is yeah the time for them to understand and appreciate that freedom to protect yeah. it themselves. Yeah. Um, and so that was probably when I started realizing that this, this was not going to be, yeah. this was a marathon. Yeah. It's such a different, you know, the entire war, such a different frame of reference than a traditional war where it's like, Hey, us versus them. We know mm -hmm. who they are. Mm -hmm. We're we're fighting. Maybe not in old school Revolutionary War mm -hmm. lines, but we at least understand through World War One, World War Two. Mm -hmm. Like we know who the enemy is. We know who the good guys yep. are, and we we know where we're fighting. This entire uh, situation, both in Afghanistan and then in Iraq, completely different, and yes. and completely something that uh, you know doctrine and counterinsurgency yep. and all these things were having to be made as mm -hmm. as the sausage is going. As you shift over in Iraq. What's your lens as now 
having the Somalia, uh, you know, experience being on Task Force Sword going into Afghanistan, and then now, all right, now we're engaged in this other, uh, this other theater. What's your lens as you go into Iraq the first time? It, it, you know, it, it was it's such a different fight. Yeah. It was such a different environment, and and the the people that you're fighting kind of what drove them was different. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, understanding your enemy and understanding what, what, you know, drives them to think or feel the way they do. In Afghanistan, it, it wasn't until, you know, when we went on the raid, I, I met nobody in person that night. You know, we're just shooting. Right, yeah. And when we, when we reinserted, yeah. I'm actually meeting forces that were negotiating with, um, with Karzai yeah. That the day before were Taliban. Today they're drinking the tea, turning the turban, and now they're going to join forces. And so you're literally, in a way, meeting them in yeah. the daylight, face to face, and 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 really trying to see and understand their culture. And they're obviously looking at you the same way. And you know, this is a very brief moment in time, but it it you know it was very clear what drove them and how and how he used that to build his force for us to go in and take Kandahar because we literally yeah. we literally went from there and took Kandahar without a shot fired yeah and it literally was taking and building the force and then going in now stuff happened once we were in sure. there but um that's but, a great point though as you're as you're there with Karzai and you're you're seeing how he's maneuvering that. Mm -hmm. What was your, you know, what was your thought? As that is a very different, you know, and we're only talking a couple of months difference mm -hmm. between, hey, we're going to hit you anywhere that you, you lay right. your head down. We we got you versus we're going to try to do this more of a diplomatic and we're going to go through the right. Northern Alliance and through cars. Well, I, I think it was like what, what drives them, what so, yeah. like, if you go up to somebody... Tribal in, motivations. Right. And like, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. it. So, when you go to somebody in Afghanistan, and you go, are you an Afghani? No. They right. refer exactly. to their tribe. 100%. And yeah. so, they, their uh, their loyalty and allegiance was to the tribe. And as if that tribe grew, that allegiance yeah. grew that way. And and, and there was, a, there was a, a religious component to it. But I thought when you get into Iraq, yeah. that is more of kind of a, a, a religious divide yeah. as far as the two groups and and yeah. what drove them to be or not to be in yeah. the fight no it's a great point yeah I had similar experiences in between mm -hmm. uh going to afghanistan and going to iraq it, it uh, you know i think that's a misconception from folks from outside that haven't been there that yeah there's not a national identity especially mm. in afghanistan in the same way and it's almost like uh you know it's almost like game of thrones it's like the name and the tribe is so important and how how do I position so that my tribe mm -hmm. is looked at as as strong? Yeah. Um, well, so, somebody yeah. told me a long time ago, if you want to understand that area, watch the movie Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it really kind of puts some perspective to it because at that point during that, that time, they drew lines based on geography, yeah. not by tribes right. and territories. And so... They, you know, when the Brits were doing that, they were dividing people, yep. you know, and, 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 it, and, you know, years later, you see kind of the, the outcome of that. You know, right. I, I know they didn't, you know, they didn't see it at the time, but, yeah, yeah. but really, I mean, they, they don't care about the river and they don't care about <laughs> the mountain range. You right. know, it's, it's my territory and my tribe. Yeah, we're drawing national borders <laughs> in, in between the middle of tribes that are now have the same tribe as in multiple different countries yeah. And, and yeah it uh, obviously has led to uh, quite a bit of strife as you as you get into Iraq and mm -hmm. you're you're now uh, leading operations there different fight more urban for mm -hmm. at least for most of us that went to both but for you I mean you were hitting you were hitting pretty urban targets in yeah. Afghanistan as well like how did you how did you use the experience from one to sort of help the other although they're different situations different motivations of the enemy how did you feel like the lessons learned push and pull between those uh, 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 I, I I think it was uh, instrumental and in, uh, you know I won't mention their names but sure. th there were guys especially in the very beginning uh, that were Somalia vets yeah. and now they're you know they're they're you know team leaders troops are majors and whatnot and they had that experience yeah. and and i will tell you it paid dividends um as we conducted operations you know our rotation was cycle was a little bit different right. than, than other folks but but the the busyness of it you know when we my first i think my first rotation in iraq we did in a in a 90-day period we did about 45 combat missions yeah and that was a lot we yeah. thought man this is a lot yeah 
And my last rotation, 90-ish day rotation, we did about 120 yeah. combat operations. And so it was, you know, it was, it was applying those lessons learned because the intensity of our missions and pressing, uh, it just, it grew and grew and grew. And so, you know, you had to be at, at your peak performance uh, during that entire time. There was no rest. It was go, go, go. Yeah. But that was kind of the way why we did that. And, and what I loved was on the ground, I think this is where, again, the, the soft community, the soft enterprise comes together and understands because we have, you know, we have all kinds of soft out there, but I will tell you, Special Forces was out there and and they're in all the very austere locations. Yeah. They're everywhere and they're developing that intelligence, that information that is oh so critical. Right. You know, and 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 I think there was a point when, you know, the light bulb went off and said, man, we've got a lot here. We need to start using it. Yeah. And so by bringing all that together made the fighting force on the ground uh, from the soft community perspective, uh, m way more effective uh, in use of assets, uh, use of information, yeah. and, and getting the job done. And I think if you look at those periods in the war, you will see the most effective uh, um, progress made. Because as you know, there was, there was the very bloody period right. of Iraq. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and then the IED thing was obviously bad, but there yeah. was very much the mano a mano period towards yep. the beginning. Yep. And, uh, and I think um, we had leaders and commanders that recognized what I just outlined and put it into play. Yeah. And, and because of that, we were effective. Yeah. And as you, as you continue in your career, at what point do you, you know, you now, as we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, as we're, we'll get into the foundation and Task Force mm -hmm. Dagger and all those things, you have a wealth of experience throughout your career and many, um, many opportunities to, uh, to face some really cumulative operational stress, right? As you're going into that treadmill mm -hmm. environment again and again, how did you see sort of the resilience uh, component? Um, you know, JSOC units have a great uh, ability to continue on that treadmill but how did you see when did it start kind of getting in the back of your mind like hey i want to help right all these people you know, so my um, tribe sort of thing so it you know when when i when i when i finally you know retired when i got out yeah. a, a lot of the programs that are available today were, were not right yeah, in yeah. existence at sure. the time yeah so you know as much as you feel you've had an impact no matter yeah. where you come from the train keeps moving. Sure, they yeah, say yeah. thank you for everything you did, <laughs> and see you later. Yeah, and the, and their focus, their mission focus, as yeah. it should be. Yep, absolutely. You know, it stings a little bit. Yeah, sure. But but it should be that way. Yeah. It has to be that way. Yeah. Um, but when I got out, you know, you know, we we all everybody has challenges and struggles, and I will tell you, it it's because of the time that I have spent with the foundation that I have the perspective I have now. At the mm. time, I was learning. Sure, yeah. And, and, and for me, you know, I had challenges and, you know, some of the things I, I you know, the things that you, you think about or you deal with, I didn't necessarily know what it was. Mm -hmm. But for me, the way I took on retirement and, and my next role was it's my next mission. Yeah. I'm going to take everything that I applied that made me successful in my, my military career and I'm going to apply that to this. Yeah. And it's just, it's a new mission. And, and, and that really helped me kind of put things into perspective and move out and, and, you know, try to continue to be successful no matter what I did. And if you look, if you look across the board today, uh, the, 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 from the soft enterprise and all the people that have gotten out, you know, whether it be injured, retired, whatever, right. the things that they're doing, the successes that they are having is, is amazing. Yeah. You know, whether they're doing entrepreneurial stuff or whatever. Um, but it, 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 it says a lot about the caliber of people. So I bring that up because, you know, I'll speak for myself, you know, when I, when I ran across people that were struggling, you know, I, I didn't know, do, am I seeing weakness? Am yeah. I seeing this? Am I seeing that? Because I didn't really have an appreciation for it. Yeah. When I, when I started working with uh, task force dagger and, and really getting involved and in, in working with people which in turn it got me to work with people I personally knew. Yeah. 
And so now I have a measure. Yeah. Now I have a measure of an individual because I've I've been in combat with them. I know right. them personally. I know I know their strengths, I know their weaknesses. And when I saw them struggle, yeah. It it really took me back and opened my eyes. Yeah. Because I understood in that moment what I thought could be weakness is not weakness because I know this individual would never right. ever want this path for themselves or their family. Yeah. Um and that being another point was what I loved about that, what I loved about Task Force Dagger was their approach to the type work they did. You know, there's a lot of great organizations out there that do a lot of great things. Sure. Um, Task Force Dagger focuses on three things, and that is it. And but they do those things really, really well. But most importantly, out of those things, they focus on the entire family. Mm-hmm. And and I noticed that, you know, I can fix the he or she service person. Yeah. But if I'm not addressing the family and the kids, I'm not really fixing anything. I may be putting a Band-Aid on it or, you know, kind of kicking the can down the road. But whatever that, that deep-rooted issue is will resurface. And so you really have to kind of attack it that way. And we've seen our greatest success doing that. Um, and immediate needs is kind of something we work directly with the command, sure. with yeah. the Warrior Care Program with, and and um, and you know, support those things that come from us. And those are generally things that are like what the VA won't cover, what the government won't cover, or their personal insurance. And so sure. those needs go through a process and come to us. And that's really catching people at, at, at the at the very beginning yeah. of, of, of things that they need support on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give our, uh, if you've listened to the show before, you've heard this disclaimer before, but you're going to hear it again, which is basically that, hey, U.S. Special Operations Command doesn't officially endorse any nonprofit, non-federal entity, 501c3, any of those things. However, we are, at speaking as the POTIF guy, incredibly blessed to have a robust network mm-hmm. of amazing organizations that help either current or former members and their families. That's and right. Task Force Dagger is 100% one of them. And we uh, are blessed, you know, when Mark talks about working with the command, you know, we, we have done this over the last 20 years of finding the right way to legally vet mm-hmm. needs to come through, to have them vetted to where the organization is vetted, the person who has this need is vetted. And, and quite frankly, we need the external support at times because the bureaucracy takes yeah. too long to respond to some things sure. whether it's in in my lane as the as the potif guy or whether yep. it's warrior care whatever uh there are we are I, I guess i should back up and say we are blessed to have a supportive citizenry first yeah right we have uh folks that want to help our service members and then we have people who have uh, started organizations and have committed their lives to being the middle ground in between uh, you know, the service member who needs yep. help or the family that needs help and, and the people who want to help yep. uh, that are American citizens. So with Task Force Dagger, with the foundation, again, not specifically endorsing, but we want to talk to Mark and we want to talk to Mark about what he's passionate about. So I think I got enough out there that the legal team won't kick the door in. <laughs> now we can discuss. But, uh, you know, Task Force Dagger is something that, uh, you know, uh, I've seen work quite a bit over my uh, time here in Tampa and, and back at group. You know, how... I guess we talked about immediate needs. Mm-hmm. We talked to Jeff Darty a little bit about some of the the medical and sort of educational realm of the health uh, initi- yeah, the, initiatives. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Which Jeff is one of the most passionate, amazing guys yep. on earth about being so dug into the health initiatives and does a, a phenomenal job. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back season one somewhere. Uh, Chelsea from Hunter Seven and Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, but talk to us about sort of the other initiatives and and why they've been important. Uh, sure. to the foundation and, wh- sure. and who they're helping. Yeah. So before I get there to yeah. touch on that point, you know, it, it's important. And, and you bring up that point about Jeff and, and Hunter seven, you know, like I said, we do three things and that's it. And yeah. and I get people at their worst, but when I'm done, where do we go? Yeah. And so yeah. just as important as, as what we do is what other organizations do. So for yeah. me, it's not about creating a bureaucracy yeah. uh, uh, for a benevolent organization. It's about how do we work together as organizations yeah. so that I can keep these people on a positive path. Yeah. I, we work with Hunter Seven quite a bit. Yeah. We work with other organizations quite a bit, and and it's important to be able to do that and reach across those lines and 
and harvest and leverage the things that they offer yeah. as as well. And uh, and 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 for the command to have the the foresight to navigate kind of the legalities that you talk about that you know they bridge to allow uh, the warrior care program to to be able to interact with the benevolent organizations yeah. to to leverage that is tremendous i mean yeah. i mean that was that was one of the game changer things because in my mind what what draws me to this and and the reason why i'm so passionate is if we don't take care of our own nobody else will yeah and so for me it it's you know i i was wounded a number of times but at the same time i walked away pretty good right and i know a lot of folks didn't and yeah. and we want to make sure that they were there we are there for their visible and in, invisible injuries and, and and help their family out but to yeah. answer your question so you know Je jeff is instrumental for yeah. us yeah. and and his knowledge base on the health initiatives but we, we you know we have a saying like a lot of a lot of organizations do we, we we talk about mission purpose and focus and and that is probably the three words when people get out are the biggest challenges yeah, to, to feel like they've yeah. got that mission purpose and, and and a focus on what's my next whatever yeah and sometimes it takes people a little while to figure that out and 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 a lot of times we're able to provide events and engagements that help them through that process keep them out of that 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 spiral yeah that downward spiral that can lead to very bad things yeah. and you know one of them is dagger dive and that's that's kind of our signature event where we go down to key west the the community opens up to us yeah. the special forces dive school uh, allows us to use their pool the facility it's amazing how the uh the the commands step in because at the end of the day they know yeah. the end state who we're helping yeah, and um, and a much nicer trip there than if you're going to dive school. I'll yeah. just mention in case you. Yeah, hundred percent. No, I, <laughs> a better experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'm I'm thinking, boy, this is fun. This is not a crossover, and um, but it, it just it it's really cool to see how yeah. they all open up. Um, the other thing is we're joint, you know. Yeah. So we 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 serve all the special operations, whether you're an operator, yeah. enabler, or support. Yeah. It does not matter because I think it's important that. You know, we, we see folks, um, you know, if I'm the operator, I've got a comms guy beside me, we both get blown up, I get help, well, they should get help too. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 not, not that that doesn't happen, but that's kind of how we look at it to make sure that that does in fact occur. Yeah. But uh, what Dagger Dive does is it is allows our, our active duty and our, and our uh, separated families to get back together in a very safe physically and emotional environment to reconnect and heal we use scuba diving as kind of the medium yeah and they do get you know if they they don't know how to dive they and they want they learn how to dive so now they've got something fun they can do as a family but the, yeah, but the real the real yeah. thing behind it is you get a you get a family say guys deployed mom's back you know she's running the house she becomes alpha she's got to take over that family and, and run it yeah he's down range he's alpha they come home now you got two alphas in the house yeah. you got about 36 hours of detente <laughs> and then the friction starts yeah. and you know and every family deals with it different but it's there yep and so what we try to do is create an environment understanding that going into it you know a lot of that friction is verbal mm. you know 99 percent of it's verbal so when i put them in the water i'm taking verbal out of it i'm giving mm. them something visual and touch tactile mm -hmm. and so i'm teaching them how to communicate in a completely different way yeah it's yeah. diving sure but i've literally had couples go out on the dive boat arguing <laughs> get in the water <laughs> come out and they're holding hands yeah so it, it and it's amazing and we close out with a with a, a pretty amazing uh uh dinner where we we kind of shut the doors we turn the cameras off we hand the mic and we let everybody kind of give their own personal testimony yeah and I have seen young kids speaking directly to their father and mother and sharing things amongst these because they feel safe. Right, yeah. And, and the healing that comes out of it's amazing. The other thing I'll touch on real quick is um, we're in a unique position that we have a, a memorandum of agreement with Department of POW and MIA Accounting Agency, which is an agency yeah. under DOD, and East Carolina University's their Marine Archaeology Department. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're using our veterans to go out and look for, search, find, and then recover 
with the intent of repatriating these loss from previous conflicts. Yeah. And we've been doing it in Saipan since 2018. Wow. Um, and obviously, you know, our soft folks come with a, 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 a very good skill set. Sure. So that 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 plays into this process very well, but it really gives them. This is a government yeah. mission. Yeah, it's and, purpose. Yeah, and, and very much mission, purpose, and focus, and gives them that. Um, and if you're not, you know, downrange defending your nation, being able to go back and recover the remains yeah. of our lost is such an honorable thing to yeah, do. Yeah, it's a solemn duty. Absolutely, yeah. that's and, awesome. And, you know, I had I had a, the the situation I mentioned in um, some Somalia where we had our folks uh, being drugged through the streets. Yeah. You know, we weren't we weren't sure we were going to get them back. Yeah. And then when when that J dam hit, we lost a guy, mm. and uh, you know we we were only you know only able to bring back what we could. Right. But there was that moment where we thought maybe we can't. Yeah. And, and so it just kind of reinforces. And I know I'm not the only one with a with a story like yeah. that, but it 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 just kind of reinforces how important being able to connect with our our our, our lost and, and bring them home. Hundred yeah. percent. That's phenomenal. And I love I love what you said as far as the dagger dive is like we don't think of it this way, but you know why are we so close to our mates on teams? Mm -hmm. It's from shared experience, right? Mm -hmm. Like mostly shared hardship, right? Like you're always closer. Yep. Whether it's a combat experience, whether it's some sort of a brutal training evolution uh you know physical training whatever it is shared hardship always makes you closer and, it, yep. and it's it's shared around an external hardship not shared hardship is just you and i fighting right there's an external thing that we're both on the team against and a dive and things like that give an opportunity for that family to have a shared hardship i know for my wife you know it's uh you know for my wife and kids it, it's it's hard to find something where you are on the same team against something from the outside. Like that's what you need to build that teamwork and camaraderie. If dad or mom is always out fighting with some other team against a shared enemy, and then they come back to you and all you get is sort of the, um, you know, more of the counseling side of it and right. not like, Hey, we're let's, let's be on a team together against, you know, whatever, against this dive against, uh, you know, whatever it is, I think it's a phenomenal yeah. way to build that, you know, that shared hardship, that shared camaraderie, uh, not necessarily to make them go through the Q course uh, with no. you or something like that. But no. having a shared, you know, sort of purpose, uh, I think is a very cool way to build it together where now it, it, the friction can be against someone else and not against each other. So that's no. very cool. Well, and, and you yeah. talk to some of these families and they haven't been on a, you know, we, we don't call this a vacation. Sure. Yeah. But for them, in a sense, it is. Yeah. And, you know, we've had people come on there and, and, and share with us that they haven't been on a vacation in five years. Yeah. You know? So yeah, yeah. being able to put them in an environment where they can, you know, spend some quality family time amongst these other things yeah, that we're, yeah. we're helping with. But it, it's huge. It's, it, you know, yeah. it, it the feedback is tremendous. Yeah, we were, uh, you know, we had another guest, Bob Delaney, on. He talks a lot about mental toughness and about, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress and things like that. And one of the biggest points that he had was, you know, peer-to-peer -peer conversation mm -hmm. with people who have shared experience. Uh, that is where you can release some of that stress more easily than necessarily talking to, uh, not that there's not a place for medical intervention right. and those things, but we all know sitting around a campfire off gassing some of that stress is a uh, is is definitely a mechanism that can help in providing opportunities for those peer groups and even spouse to yep. spouse peer mm -hmm. uh, interaction uh, super vital. I'm curious when you look at resilience, man. You story career, obviously Commando Hall of Honor. You were in these critical and amazing points of history. You were on that treadmill for a long time. When you look back at it, what what do you credit as Mark Stevens? sort of nugget of how how are you able to continue to be resilient through that everybody's got their own sort of mechanisms i'm just curious sure. you know we heard about your amazing you know career and we, we had to skip it short you know because we we're, were kind of time constrained because i wanted to talk about the foundation a little bit yep. but i'm just curious you know what do you attribute your resilience to you know uh, that's a that's a that's a tough question i mean yeah. you know i was very fortunate i did get hurt but yeah. you know i i was not hurt to the point where I, I wasn't able to, to, to make a form of recovery and continue yeah. on. Um, I think for me, 
it's you know I, I know it may sound a little cliche, but it's it's a bit of love and country and and, yeah. and the mission. And I found a home in special operations, and yeah. I felt as long as that I was in a position that I was value added and I could contribute, that I would. Yeah. And you know it was it sucked stepping off that train. Yeah. It did. Yeah. But you know because I feel you know like you, you you always feel like you can be a part of it. And, and again, the, why I do yeah. what I do at the foundation, this Absolutely. is my next part of it. Yeah. But, um, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the cool things that I had, had the opportunity to do that I'll share was, uh, President Bush came over for that unannounced Thanksgiving visit yeah. in 2003. Yeah. I ran that detail there. Yeah. And so the whole world, there was 18 people at, any, at the time that knew it was happening. Yeah. They were going to sequester the, uh, the press pool if they didn't want to get on the plane. And the only reason why I bring this up, this gets to the, the why. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, they're all going to go. And, you know, I'm working with the, the, the lead Secret Service guy. We're bringing him over. And my assumption is we're going to transfer him off of Air Force One onto a military looking asset and bring him in. Well, here it is by up. It's getting dark. I'm looking up under my nods right in the middle of the air, the airstrip, and I'm like, man, that's a big plane. <laughs> and I realized that's Air Force One. And, and uh, man, the, those pilots are amazing. They put that thing on the ground from 10,000 feet, one turn on the ground. Wow. And then uh, we, uh, we scooped him up. And the moment that is probably the coolest moment of patriotism – and and I reflect back on this a lot, and it, it you know it was cool yeah. that it was President Bush, but it, it wasn't about him in the, in this moment. It was about our forces in 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 the office he held. Yeah. So they have this chow hall. You've got uh, Ambassador Bremer in there. You know he's reading a letter from the president to to them for Thanksgiving, yeah. and we've got the president right behind this netting, <laughs> and he goes, "Well, who better to read the letter than the president himself?" And we pull the netting back, and he walks out, and That's it was, awesome. and it was the true, just patriotism, and and shock yeah. and thankfulness of this group yeah. that has left a, a lasting impression on me because you know it was it was just one of those moments that you felt so damn proud yeah that's awesome and, and for me those are the things it's those kind of moments that always kept me going and wanting to do this yeah it's phenomenal there's uh there's moments where uh you're like i can't believe they pay me to do this and then there's people there's of course buoyed by moments where you're like i can't believe i accept pay to right. do this <laughs> this is uh maybe yeah. you know and you gotta I, yeah. I used to say as a team starter like man you got to try to balance it out you got to you yep. got to relish those moments when you get that opportunity where you're like yeah i'm in a priceless position in in a, a piece of history in a place that i would never be able to be it's just an amazing opportunity and i think uh i i think when we talk about resilience, we talk about having that mission focus. I think it's so critical. We talk about it, whether we talk about it in uh, suicide prevention or whether mm -hmm. we talk about it in transition, whatever it is. One of the hardest things you could possibly ever do is try to recover or be resilient from something without having a goal or a purpose. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, almost every resilient story where we have one of these amazing people, whether it's on the show or just people that you and I both know that we've talked to in the past, it's the moment where they're like, I set this goal that I was going right. to, whatever, return to a team or run a marathon or yep. ride a bike across the nation, whatever it was, there was some sort of catalytic focus, purpose, mission. Mm -hmm. And so many folks, when they take off the uniform or when they're injured and unable to do it anymore, if they don't get another mission, purpose, and focus, mm -hmm. it, it can be, you know, uh, very much the beginning of that funnel down. Yeah. Uh, and yep. so I, I think it's very interesting. You are one of the folks that was able to, you know, recognize that right away and find, hey, all right, I'm going to devote my new mission purpose focus is to this foundation and we're going to help others make sure that they have it. Uh, and I, I think it's a phenomenal point. Um, you know, I've kept you a little bit longer than I promised. I appreciate it. I want to turn it over to you. Is there any any last thoughts you want to leave the listeners before uh, before we wrap it up? I just want to say thank you. I want to uh, for the opportunity to uh, you know to share some of this stuff. I think um, you know we 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 have an amazing history 
Yeah. And and the soft community should be very proud of what they've accomplished for this nation and keeping, you know, keeping our citizens free and safe. And and now I'm one of those, and you guys doing that for us, and uh, and you know, being able to share the past what leads into the present. Um, I think it's important that we continue to do that because there's always something there to be learned and for somebody to take something away in a positive way and do something good with it. Um, and, you know, so no, just just thank you. I appreciate it very much. No, thank you. I, I, I completely echo your thoughts on that. I mean, one of the things I have enjoyed about being the host of the show is the ability to have some of these conversations that, you know, we have such an incredible caliber of men and women that serve in special operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's critical for us to, you know, we all say, yeah, yeah, we, we, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and all those things, but taking the opportunity to talk through uh, even the more recent history of some of these things. I mean, they're the caliber of people and the amount of uh, precision and professionalism that's Mm -hmm. been shown uh, it is phenomenal. I can't thank you enough for coming on on behalf of uh, General Fenton and all of us at US SOCOM. Thanks, Mark, again. Thanks for everything you're doing post service as well. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, you know, I've had personal experience with Task Force Dagger, and uh, I think it's a, a phenomenal organization, and I appreciate it. And for all of you out there listening, hey, thanks for listening to another episode of Softcast. Uh, no matter where you're listening to this or watching it on YouTube, uh, take a moment now, go down, give it a, a thumbs up, a five star review, uh, or write us a review. Uh, take this opportunity too to share. Uh, send this episode to somebody who you think, uh, either on your team or in your circle, who you think uh, might enjoy this episode. And uh, follow USOCOM at SOCOM or at USOCOM at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And if you got any feedback, somebody you want to hear from, uh, something you want to know about, hit us up, softcast at socom.mil. So on behalf of all of us here at SOCOM, thanks for listening to another episode of SOFTCAST. Mm-hmm.